Well, Razorback fans, I'm tired of talking about basketball, even though we're going to talk about basketball a little bit in this podcast. But I do want to talk about football. Question I've been asked a lot about a starting quarterback and who's going to win the battle. So let's break it down on today's Locked On Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also the host of the John Neighbors Show here on Natty State Sports. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 4 to 6 on Natty State Sports and nattystatesports.com. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Hope everybody's having a wonderful day. Wednesday here in the great state of Arkansas as we have a lot of things to try to get to today and try to make sense out of at least I'm hoping we can make some sense out of it but uh, I wanted to bring up something different like I'm just the basketball team I'm kind of over right now they're not I'm, they're not they're on my list they're on my list of uh, things that aren't making me very happy and I don't think anybody's really happy with them so let's talk about something else that I'm sure is going to make everybody happy and not have any issues whatsoever, and that's the football team. You know, the football team has so much mystery behind them where I'm not going to sit here and try to predict that they're just going to be some amazing team. I'm not going to sit here and try to predict that they're just going to blow it out of the water and they're going to be awesome and they're going to be winning all these games. Like, I'm not going to do that. But it is still interesting. And I was actually having a conversation with my guys here at Natty State Sports, about the the quarterback battle itself and some of the things that are surrounding it and, and some of the things that are going into it. And it really started making me think back to how long it's been since Arkansas has had a true, legitimate quarterback battle. Now, some of you may bring up the Chad Morris years. No, uh, those don't count. Those don't count for anything because quarterback battles, I feel like, have to have at least some sort of understanding or maybe at least a little bit of a little bit of a college coach like because he wasn't a college coach Chad Morris wasn't a college coach he wasn't a coach at all like it has to have some sort of actual credibility into making the decision of the quarterback for it to be a quarterback battle so that's why I don't count Chad Morris he had none of that but moving that aside it's been a long time since Arkansas has had a legitimate quarterback battle you think about it, KJ's been the guy for the past three years. And before that, I mean, you had Felipe Franks. And we're deleting Chad Morris. But even before that, you had Austin Allen. Before that, you had Brandon Allen. Before that, you had Tyler Wilson. Before that, you had Ryan Mallett. And before that, you got Casey Dick. So in, in a way, it's probably the 06, maybe 08, Bobby Petrino's first year here, because I think that was the year where it was Nathan Dick, Casey, Casey Dick's brother, and they kind of had some times here and there to play up against each other. But either way, if you say it's 06, if you say it's 08, it doesn't matter. Either way, that's been a long time. We're talking about nearly coming up on two decades where Arkansas had a true, legitimate quarterback battle. And when I started thinking about that, I'm like, okay, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, because everyone talks about quarterbacks battle being extremely healthy and everything. And I'm like, okay, well, there's some health to it. But as long as it's healthy competition, you got teams that are trying to, to win or uh, players that are trying to vouch for the job because they're just really good and somebody has to edge out the other one. Not just where both are really bad, but also not where there's just a clear-cut favorite who's so good or maybe I should say the other guys are so bad that the other guy is so good. You know what I'm saying? Like you got to have it some sort of healthy sort of going up against each other in practices. And I think that in every case, you want the best player to play and you want to have the best quarterback to win. But in this particular case with Arkansas, it's truly unknown. Like we can sit here and I'll give my opinions on things. And like, I'll, I'll give you my opinion on what I think on who is going to be, but if you told me that it wasn't going to be who I picked, I wouldn't be like, oh, what happened? It was shocking. I didn't know. Here's the thing. I believe it's going to be Taylor Green. 
This, to be honest, I, I believe it's going to be Taylor Green. 6'6", 220 pounds, transfer out of Boise State. His numbers weren't exactly setting the world on fire, as we all know, and people keep bringing that up as like, oh, it's some sort of thing against him or, or whatever. My thing is, I do trust Bobby Petrino. And I don't think Bobby Petrino would have brought in a quarterback, especially via the transfer portal, that at least wasn't somewhat decent, somewhat, you know, average. You know, like, I just don't think he's going to bring in somebody that's not going to make the team better or at least be someone who can legitimately fight for the starting job. Plus, let's be honest, a quarterback always, or a coach always likes to have their quarterback in, their guy. And Bobby Petrino's guy right now is Taylor Green. Because if you think about the rest of them, um, you know, think about your Colby Criswell. It's a guy that was the backup this past year, played a little bit. He's a redshirt senior, uh, been a player who's an in-state kid. And I'm not saying I have any problem with Jacoby Criswell, and I'm not even saying that I don't want him to start. But again, it's like that was a guy that was brought in technically with the Bryles, Eno's transition, and don't really haven't seen enough of him to know how good he actually is. Even when he was at North Carolina, there's really nothing that you can point to. Be like, oh, this is why he's really good. Could be. Maybe. But I don't see any full-fledged evidence of it. So he's going to be definitely in the mix. But then you throw in guys like a Malachi Singleton, who's now going to be a second-year player, redshirts freshman, four-star player when he was coming out of high school, and highly regarded. Highly regarded. Is he going to play? Is he even going to have a chance? What about K.J. Jackson, the true freshman out of Montgomery? What about Austin Ledbetter, you know, the former baseball player? The point is, you're going to have some depth there, and you got some guys that really, with between Criswell and uh, K.J. Jackson, as well as Malachi Singleton, those are guys that were four-star players coming out of high school, highly regarded players. And you have Taylor Green, who's at least, of all of them, the most experienced player. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, Boise State, you can, you know, like look at that, that in some negative way, but it's true. It's like that's more experience than most of these guys have, at least. So you're talking about Taylor Green being the guy that has the most experience, being the guy that has the most, I don't, even, I don't want to say that, but being the guy that at least has the confidence from the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. I was about to say who, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to say it. Anyways, you know what I'm talking about. It's about the confidence that he has. And you also have a guy who seems to be ahead of the eight ball because he's been handpicked, hand selected by the current offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. So all those things together with the experience, and he does have talent. He's a big-bodied guy, and he's shown that he can play. I mean, he was the, in the conference championship game. He was the MVP of the game uh, coming out of the Mountain West. So you know he's capable of it, but will that be enough? Will that be enough? I don't know, but I am, I'm actually looking forward to a quarterback battle. And in, and in a way, I don't really want a quarterback to be named – at least until fall camp, maybe first or second week. I really hope that's what we get. Because say if Taylor, and it sounds weird, but say if like Taylor Green, first or second week of spring ball, is announced the starter, I'll be like, okay, one of two things either happen. Either one, Petrino was like, ah, I ain't going to look at any of these other guys, and I'm just going with my guy. Or two, those guys are been who are these freshmen and are these four-star players or Criswell, whatever, they ain't it at all. And Bobby's like, nah, we this is our best bet. None of those are really good answers, but I, I really hope I think it'd be best if we get to fall camp before quarterbacks named officially. But I do believe it's going to be Taylor Green. I'm not exactly going out on a limb, but I do believe it's going to be Taylor Green. Uh we're going to talk another thing about football too, because I saw Landon Jackson on ESPN a preseason All-American. How about that? And we'll talk about that here in just a second. But folks, the NFL regular season is wrapped up and we know we're in postseason play officially. So it's time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. And that's when you hit a $5 bet. There's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is way easy to use. And there are so many ways to bet, like same game, live parlays, 
You have bets in the new Explore tab that makes it really easy, too. And you can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, which is the best way to find popular parlays, and so much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an easy layup. It's FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so moving on into the next segment of the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. So how about this? ESPN came out with their way too early. This is Chris Lowe, by the way, which I really like Chris Lowe. I don't care what anybody says. I like Chris Lowe. It's like one of the few big J journalists that's been covering college football and has been doing it for ESPN, has not gotten laid off and has not jumped jobs or anything. He's just been still there and still still making it happen. So and I just realized my uh, graphic says college game day coming to Fable. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> we're talking about the All-American preseason way too early deal from Chris Lowe when he came out with his teams there. And uh, uh, most of them probably weren't too surprising. Um, and then again, this is not all SEC. This is All-American. And I was a little bit shocked to see that there was a Razorback on this list. And so I, w- I was going through it all and, you know, thinking about, the different you know, players that are listed and some of the high quality players that are listed. And it's like, man, okay, that's uh, that's pretty amazing. It's pretty good. But I also think it's, it's pretty funny how like a Carson Beck, like seeing Carson Beck at the all American spot. And this is nothing against him. Cause I know he, he gets uh, thrown in there a lot, but to see Carson Beck right in there, that was a little bit, surprising personally like I, I just again I know I'm talking about the quarterback but still just a little bit surprising either way it doesn't matter let's move on uh but second team all-american Landon Jackson was actually on this list with uh Ashton Gillette or Gillett I think it's how I actually pronounce his name from Louisville being first team all-american now when I saw this I'm like okay well that, that mean Landon Jackson did have a really good year and I was a little bit surprised to be honest that he even returned to Fayetteville and returned to Arkansas after having such a nice year as a junior and possibly deciding that he wanted to move on into the NFL. You know, like, why wouldn't why wouldn't you? I feel like he would have been drafted. But I'm glad he came back. He was one of the few players that I felt like really getting him back was going to be nothing but a benefit to Arkansas and a benefit to what they're trying to do. But to see him as a, as a second-team All-American, it, it just – maybe this is just my – bad feeling, bad vibe, Razorback fan, PTSD that just gets involved and makes it really frustrating. But I feel like almost every time that Arkansas, at least here in recent history, has had a preseason All-American or somebody on an All-American second team list or whatever, they never get to that point. I think Traylon Burks might have been the best, kind of depending on who you looked at and whatnot. But, man, how many players did you, could you just look at and it just seems like none of them ever get to that point? I mean, Rocket Sanders was one last year. We know that didn't work out. Um, you know, I, I, I want to say that even during the Bielema era, there were a few guys that were mentioned, but, you know, none of them, like, lived up to that, or at least a few of them didn't live up to that hype. But that, again, I'd, I'd have to really go back. But the point is, it's just – I really get eerie of a lot of these preseason deals that come into play for football players, especially somebody like Landon Jackson. Now, Landon Jackson's really good. Don't get me wrong. But I'm telling you right now, if Landon Jackson has a season that gets him to be named second-team All-American when it's all said and done, Arkansas is going to have a really a really good year. I know that maybe looking at it very simplistically, but truly, if you have a defensive end that is All-American, I don't even care if it's second-team. Let's say he's second-team. You're talking about an, an, a defensive end that is one of the four best defensive ends in the country. That alone right there is going to be a difference in these games. And if you don't believe me, just ask Trey Flowers. You know, now I know he had Darius Phylon. He had some you know, really good defensive players around. Marshall Spate was really good. Don't again, but go back and watch those highlights. Go back and watch Trey Flowers. Go back and watch what he did. There were times, and I'll never forget it, against Alabama and even Ole Miss in that 2014 season 
they had to double team and almost in some cases triple team him because he was so monstrous. He changed games. He changed to where suddenly it opens up other players to make tackles, like in this case of Martrell Spader, Darius Phylon, because they had to double team him. It made the quarterbacks be very wary of him. I mean, it changes the entire game. Now, yeah, you want to have an All-American at every position, and if you have an All-American at quarterback, it's the most important position on the field for sure. But I even make the argument, folks, that if I was to take, besides quarterback, a position that you could just give me an All-American at, it's going to be defensive end. It's going to be defensive end. Because when you're that level good where nobody can stop you, and so they have to overcompensate for you, which opens up other opportunities for other players, that changes the dynamic. That changes the defense. That changes everything. So I truly hope that Landon Jackson becomes an All-American. First team, second team, don't care. But I was uh, I was at least a little pleased to see that he got some recognition because I think Landon Jackson's a really good player. He's a really good kid, and uh, hopefully he has a really big year. But, man, if he can be an All-American, it's going to be a different maker for uh, Arkansas this year, that's for sure. Yes, we will talk a little basketball here on the other side of the break, so stay with us. You are locked on Razorbacks. Your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Uh, Arkansas and Ole Miss play each other, and I also got this graphic wrong. I'm just really screwing up tonight. It's okay. Um, nah, you guys aren't watching the graphics anyways. Let's be honest. You're just listening to my hot takes and these this beautiful pipes of a voice that I have. Either way. Uh, it's not on the SEC Network, Arkansas and Ole Miss. It's actually on ESPNU. Game's at 8 o'clock tonight, and Ole Miss is actually good. Now, they're 15-3 and three overall, but they're 2-3 and three in conference play. So all three of their losses have come into conference play. Chris Beard's a really good coach. Um, but the losses that they suffered was against Tennessee. They got smoked. Against LSU on the road, which they lost by 9. And then they beat uh, or lost to Auburn on the road, which they lost by a pretty good margin. Uh, so geez, 23 points. Auburn's really good. I hate to admit it, but they're good. So they did beat Vanderbilt and they did smoke Florida. So it's basically where they have lost all the road games and won all their home games. And Arkansas is going to be a home game for them. I'm going to be honest. I have no faith right now in Arkansas to win this game. No faith. I have no faith that they'll go in and take care of business. The last I saw is that Arkansas was favored, or excuse me, Almost messed that up. Ole Miss was favored by five and a half points. And if I was a betting man, which of course <laughs> I'm not, but I'm probably taking the house on Ole Miss in this one, man. They're just really good. Or the matchup wise, really good against Arkansas. Uh, Ole Miss has been, and Arkansas have actually been averaging close to the same amount of points per game. Arkansas is actually out, outscoring Ole Miss in points per game, 77.6 to 76.7. But this is the big difference maker and what's been the problem. Arkansas is, this is wild. So the Arkansas is scoring 76.6 points a game. They're giving up 77.6 points a game. So every game has been a tie on average. Yeah, that ain't great. But Ole Miss has only given up 71.3 points per game. So not exactly an elite defense, but better than Arkansas. Field goal percentage, really close to the same. Arkansas shooting 45%. Ole Miss is 45.5%. Arkansas is actually out-rebounding Ole Miss, 36 rebounds to 35 rebounds, just barely. But Ole Miss is killing Arkansas in an assist game, 15 assists to 11 and a half assists. Ole Miss takes the lead there. Blocks, which Arkansas has done a really good job at blocking shots this year. They're one of the best teams in the country. They're averaging six and a half blocks a game. Ole Miss is 6.4. So you're talking about a .1 difference. Both teams really good at blocking shots. And this is also a big kicker, too. Steals per game. Arkansas has five steals per game. Ole Miss has nine. Nine steals a game. So very much uh, a big difference there. It comes down to this. I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm wrong. I'm hoping Arkansas wins this game and shuts me up and you know makes me look bad. I, I hope I really do. I really hope that happens. And they never have to, you never have to hear from me again about crowing about this team and how, my, how bad they are and how much I'm done with them. But it's just not looking that way right now, man. It's really not looking that way. And Chris Beard being an Ole Miss, I'm going to be curious how long is he there and how much success can he have? Because it's just Ole Miss is not a basketball program that is really worth their salt. And I think that they got a great hire in Chris Beard, and I think that 
He's a really good basketball coach, but I don't think he's going to be there long term, just to be honest. Uh, I could see him totally getting back into Texas in some capacity. Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it'll be to Texas, but you know, if the Texas Tech job opens up, does he Joe back, Joe back to Lovick? Maybe. I still thought it was really weird, if you remember, when he went from Texas Tech, or I guess he went from Little Rock, UALR, to UNLV, was there for like a second, and then jumped over to Lubbock. So the dude's been all over the place. And then went to Austin just a few years later, and we know what happened there. But every, he's won everywhere he's been, and he's won at a really high level, and he's done a really good job on it. So I, re- I at least respect him as a coach. Not much else, but a coach. But either way, uh, maybe they win. Probably not. We'll have to talk about it tomorrow. Well, appreciate everybody listening in to Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at John Neighbors Show for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you then.